Good afternoon. We are so glad that you are joining us this evening for This Is My Story. We are on location at the Urban Sip Coffee Shop with We Will Go Ministries. Uh, this evening our guest is Hayden Jernigan. Hayden is a recent graduate from Mississippi College. He's going to be attending seminary at New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary in the fall. Hayden has been one of our college interns, and so we're excited to have Hayden, you here tonight with us. So we begin as we do each and every week. Will you tell us your story? Absolutely. Yeah. Appreciate you, Chip. Sure. Um, so I grew up in Memphis, Tennessee. It's where I was born and raised. Um, uh, my parents divorced when I was six months old, so I didn't actually get to know my father until I was at the age of six. Um, so I grew up with my mother and my grandmother on my dad's side, lots of back and forth at a very young age, and things were just very dysfunctional at a very early age because of that. Um, my mother had a lot of emotional, mental issues that ran in through the house and unhealthy relationship with another husband that was my stepdad that was abusive emotionally and physically in a lot of ways. Um, and that was kind of my upbringing. That was really all that I knew up until I was about 11 years old. And things kind of hit a turning point. Um, my mother had pulled me out of school for about two years and I was left to help her raise my siblings. And I had four wow. other siblings at the time. Oh, wow. Um, they were all younger than me. <clears throat> I had an older sister who had moved to boarding school in Massachusetts because she was deaf. And my mom's mom on that side had, you know, made that happen, pulled strings and known people out there. Um, so that was really difficult for me because all I knew was how to raise my brothers and sisters and had a huge educational gap um, and just, I mean, being in college is nothing I ever thought would happen. but. Um, at the age of 11, my stepfather um, started to be more emotionally and physically abusive with me, and I started to tell my grandmother about it. Um, and she saw to it that I was taken away from the home. Um, and I went to move to North Texas with my grandfather, um, who's a pastor. And that was where I first was introduced to the gospel and heard about it. Um, I was in church every time the doors were open. so. I would have said I was a Christian because of that. Yeah. Looking back now, not at all. Um, but that went on. I lived with him for a few years, and then I came back to Memphis to live with my grandmother. Um, I'd finished a private school program that kind of caught me up with education a little bit. Yeah. I was still behind <clears throat> and had a huge deficit. And uh, she put me through these tutoring classes and did all spent all kinds of money to make sure that I got caught up, which was... A huge blessing um, and I started going to a private school throughout high school and playing football and football was my thing um, I wanted to be an all-american athlete I wanted to go play college football and that was my dream and that was where I was headed um, I wasn't the greatest but I, I felt like I was pretty good yeah. um, and I played uh, middle linebacker and defensive end and commanding the defense was my thing um, and then senior year, on our way to our state championship, we had gone six or seven games undefeated. I blew out my ACL, mm -hmm. um, tore my knee up really bad, and spent the championship game on the sidelines. Oh. We won, um, but that really kind of crushed that dream, and I wasn't able to properly rehab. And I was never just as good as I was before that. Um, and that kind of put me down in a dump. And it, around this time, um, I started to become curious with drug use. and started kind of following the round crowd and my dad was in and out of my life and he uh, he was struggling with his own demons and things like that and his own vices and um, he wanted to try to maintain and build a relationship with me so around all this time he gets a job in South Carolina and gets stable enough to say hey I want to try to do this with you, try to be a father, be a son, so I want you to come live with me. So I went to go live with my father, and that um, is where it just became a very permissive time in my life where anything was okay. Um, and I started, I started experimenting more and more with drugs and uh, with girls and things like that and falling deeper and deeper into those things, and me and my father did not get along. After about a year, it was just... There was no way that we could have stayed together because um, he struggled with alcoholism and I was just extremely rebellious and doing whatever I wanted to do. Um, 
So I ended up coming back to Memphis, back to this private school, and I had a very rebellious attitude at that point. And it was like, I'm just gonna do whatever I want and live however I want. And God was not a thought. Even though I was going to a private Christian school, I was like, well, I, I got that part of it, but I wanna do what I wanna do kind of thing. Um, so senior year, I'm not playing football anymore. I'm just kind of partying and doing my own thing. And people still really looked up to me um, because of who I was in football. And I was kind of this big name around school. Um, I peaked in high school. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I met this girl yeah. at 17 and completely fell in love with her and thought that this is the woman that I'm supposed to spend my life with and mm -hmm. all that. Um, and that carried on until after I graduated, <clears throat> which I didn't think I was ever going to go to college. That was never a thought in my life. And um, about a year after we met, she got pregnant. Mm. And upon that, I was kind of like, oh, wow, I'm going to be a dad and all this stuff. She was a uh, freshman at the University of Tennessee, Martin. And I was driving every weekend to go see her and all this stuff. Um, and then she calls me one day and tells me that she doesn't want to keep the child, that she wants to have an abortion. Um, and I'm just like, what? <laughs> and this is in November um, that all this happens. And I didn't want to, I wasn't OK with it and all that, but she did it anyway. She followed through. She went and had an abortion. And that really started to pull me down. And this is a spiral. Um, and then that following month, um, I had communication over the years with my mother from the time that I'd left when I was 11 was very scarce and I, I hadn't seen her since. Uh, and I got a phone call one day in December that she had passed away from a drug overdose um, about a month after this abortion and this, mm. all this strain between me and the girlfriend at the time. So that really was an excuse for me just to fall deeper and deeper into drugs, into alcohol, um, and to really doing whatever I was doing. Um, that morning when I got that phone call about my mother, I was actually at a party and I woke up and I'd been drunk the night before and just was like, you know, hello, who is this? And um, just devastated. And I just immediately turned back to drinking. And just there's this progression of failure that started happening more and more and more as I was getting older. Um, I got out in the construction field and I started making okay money, but I wanted more money, so I started selling drugs. Um, wasn't really scared of what would happen with the law and all that. It was exhilarating and my friends liked it and always had money. And um, by the time I'm 19, I go to a party one night and I end up getting in a fight with this guy. And I hurt him pretty bad and I ended up going to jail for it. After about a year of probationary meetings and um, going to court and grandmother spending tens of thousands of dollars to try to keep me out of jail, I violated my probation because I was selling drugs and I went to jail for about three months. Um, and that was the first initial time that God kind of shook me mm -hmm. and I started asking questions and started kind of trying to figure out like, okay, what's in this Bible that can help me? And I can honestly say that I would look into the Bible and it made no sense to me whatsoever. Yeah. I, I could not understand anything that it was saying. I was like, I don't get this. This is just a bunch of confusing rules that I don't want to follow. Um, and I got out and I was like, all right, I'm going to be a good man now. I'm, I'm not going to fall back into the same things. I'm just, I'm going to be moderate. I'm going to be moderate. And just mm -hmm. moderation is key. That was a, something I used to always tell myself. Um, and within a year of getting out, I was right back doing the same exact things um, that I had been doing before and probably worse. And I looked up and I had been um, stealing money from my grandmother, like hundreds of dollars at a time. Um, I had lost my job and my driver's license and my vehicle, so I lost my house and I lost everything um, because when I was younger, I used to drive around like an idiot and they yanked my driver's license. So I wasn't able to make money and my grandmother luckily had an empty rental house. She's like, well, you can just live here until you get on your feet. So I was living in this empty rental house all by myself. And God used that time to really work on my heart. Um, and it was a very, very low point in my life. I became very depressed, very sad boy. Um, and one night during this time in this rental house, um, I had some friends come over and we were partying. My friend had some drugs 
and so man, I got this, you wanna do it? And I had the last $10 to my name, not knowing where I'm gonna get my next meal, because my grandmother was giving me $100 every week, and within like the first two or three days, I'd blown it all on drugs and alcohol. And not knowing where I'm gonna get my next meal and knowing that I'm gonna have to ask my grandmother for more money, I gave up the last of my money for, this, for these drugs. Um, and long story short, we're having a conversation and my friend, for some reason, asked a question. He said, why do I feel like we worship this lifestyle? Um, like it's the first thing we think about when we wake up and the last thing we think about before we go to bed. And I was like, I don't know about you, but <clears throat> I don't worship this lifestyle. This isn't something that I'm that concerned about. And he was like, well, what's the first thing you think about when you wake up and the last thing you think about before you go to bed? And I had to ask myself that question. I'm like, it's getting high. How can I get high? How can I get money? Or how can I get in bed with a girl? That was what consumed my mind. And I'm like, wow, how did I get here? I went from almost being a college athlete to a junkie, um, really. And um, I went back in my bedroom and I sat down and I started thinking like, well, you know, um, having the abortion, that was really hard. And then it was like, okay, so you're going to blame all of your problems and all of your poor decision making on this one thing that was due to your poor decision making. And I was like, well, losing my mom, that was really hard. It's like, okay, so you're going to blame all your problems on your, your late mother. And I started to realize that I had been using all of these things in my life as an excuse just to continue in sin, really, mm -hmm. and just to keep doing the things that I wanted to do. If I was being totally honest with myself, it's like, this isn't good for me. I don't need this, but I want this because it makes me feel good. Yeah. And I want this more than anything, if I'm being honest, and I'll do anything I have to. And that's when I realized, and I started crying out to God in this moment. And the transition was, wow, I am a liar. I am a thief. Uh, I'm a cheater, I'm a drug addict, I struggle with addiction, um, I struggle with sexual addiction, I struggle with like loving myself and loving other people and wow my life's a complete mess and at the time I had my older sister that I told you about, she was back in Memphis, she was struggling with a heroin addiction hmm. in Memphis and I was telling myself constantly well I'm not as bad as she is but I looked up and I looked at the patterns that I'd seen in her life and the patterns that I'd seen in mine and they were exactly identical. Um, and I just started weeping. And what I just said, I cried out to God. I said, God, I have been a liar, a cheater. I've been all these things. Um, and I know that if I died right now that there's nothing that I've done that will get me into heaven. And there's no way I could ever put into words how God responded, that it wasn't this audible voice in my head that responded to me, but I understood and God said to me and revealed to me that there was nothing that I could ever do to be good enough to get into heaven. And that was the whole purpose of why he sent his son Jesus. And that's how great that his love is for me specifically. And when I realized that, and I believed that for the first time, I I just lost it. I wept. And in that time of weeping and, and grieving, I felt shame just come off of me. I felt hatred and anger and just things that I've carried for years that I'd never known what life was without. I felt all of that stripped away. And I mean, I don't know how long I was in there and how long I, I cried and how long I prayed and got down on my knees and, and talked to God, but that was the moment that I truly received Christ in my heart and truly believed and I told Jesus and I remember just like just help me because my life is a complete and total wreck and I've tried doing this all by myself and it has robbed me of everything um, and immediately I mean that moment my life was changed and I got up the next morning had a bunch of missed phone calls and I called my grandmother um, and she said, your older sister passed away from a drug overdose last night. So the same night that, that the Lord saved me was the same night, and the same night that I was doing drugs, the same night my sister was, and she passed away, mm -hmm. um, and I, I didn't. And 
to me, if it wasn't for what had happened, what God had done for me that night, I would not have been able to handle it the way that I did. But I ended up not only kind of being the point for my entire family through that process, but I was also able to share the gospel to my entire family through the process of, yes, this is a tragic thing that has happened, but this is who God is no matter what. Um, and that was kind of the catapult that, that ushered me into the next thing that was to come is, well, I have no job, I have no driver's license, so no vehicle, so maybe I need to go to school with all this idle time that I have. And I get to talking to my family about it, and my great-grandmother who had passed away had left a college fund for me. But they never told me because I never thought I wanted to go. Wow. And God just opened all these doors and the only Christian friend I had at the time was at Mississippi College. Hmm. Um, and we somehow got connected and started talking and I played football with him in high school and he was a few years under me. And he's like, man, come check it out. Like, we wanna see you, wanna love on you. And I came out here and as soon as I pulled up to campus, it was like 11 o'clock at night. I looked at it and I was like, this is where God wants me. Um, and immediately, I mean, everything fell into place and. Here I am, just graduated, which is incredible just to think about. I'm the only college graduate in my family, praise the Lord. Um, and now I'm going to get a master's, and God has given me a passion for counseling, yeah. of all things, um, for marriage and family, and just for young adults, for trauma, depression, um, anxiety, because I've seen firsthand how much that truly affects, not just our daily walk, but even our walk with God. Um, and just looking back, every time I tell my story, I, I'm blown away and I'm always reminded firmly of just how great the love of Christ truly is. Um, and how, I mean, I remember that later that night after that happened and I told my friends and like shared the gospel with them immediately while they were doing <laughs> drugs. I remember opening my Bible and understanding it for the very first time because I understood the character and the person of Christ. And I, I just wept because I was like, it brought those words to life and it gave them meaning and it bore weight in my heart for the first time ever. Um, and that's pretty much, in a short, short yeah. way, that's pretty much my story. Yeah, wow, appreciate you sharing that. <clears throat> you know, as I listen to your story, <clears throat> I guess there are two or three things that kind of stand out to me. One is brokenness. Um, you know, in your situation, some of the brokenness that you were around you had no control over. For instance, you were born into a home that was filled with brokenness. You, you didn't control that. Uh, however, that brokenness um, was what you saw. And it seems that early on in your life, in your early years, the way that you tried to deal with brokenness was through sin, which just began a pattern of brokenness in your life. Um, as you're going through your teenage years, it's just a continual, you, I mean, you had a lot of, you took a lot of punches. I mean, with uh, family breakdown, your mom passing away, torn ACL, um, abortion, uh, just a lot of things, you, you took a lot of punches. But the way you dealt with those punches seems to be were to kind of try to numb the pain. Yeah. Alcohol, drugs, mm -hmm. um, getting into immoral activity and just kind of trying to escape. And, and, you know, we see in Scripture that sin always leads to brokenness. And brokenness is essentially our way of trying to fix the sin problem that we have. <laughs> you know, and in, and in your case, the brokenness is is evident. I think anybody who's watching this right now would, would identify that as brokenness. However, sometimes brokenness is not as easy, easily identifiable. For instance, for in your case, your brokenness led to more of a pursuit of immoral activity. For some people, brokenness um, is, manifests itself by uh, materialism. And so we don't, we don't always equate materialism and the immoral activity that you described, but at the root it's the same thing. For some people it's um, working too much. 
it's, it's, it's trying to bury yourself in work and try to bury yourself in achievement. And your testimony is more of a kind of a stark wow testimony, whereas somebody who tries to fix the sin in their life through work it doesn't come across the same way, but the results are the same. Absolutely. And so the beauty of the gospel is that we, we realize that God has provided an answer for our brokenness and that our attempts of trying to fix the sin problems are only temporary fixes and don't last. But Jesus, who is eternal and brings eternal life, does last. And so as I hear your testimony, I hear, I see a pattern of brokenness that by God's grace you were brought out of through eternal life through Jesus. The second thing I hear in your testimony is God's grace. I mean, certainly, you know, you, you just see God's continued pursuit of you even after all the things that you'd been through in your life. And so that's, that's one of those, we just praise God for His incredible grace. But another part of your testimony that I hear is the sovereignty. You know, we don't understand sometimes why we get the lot we get in life. We don't control what family that we're born into. We don't control decisions other people make. But it is cool when you go back and you look like at your life and you hear your testimony and one evidence of the sovereignty of God in your life was your grandmother who never gave up on you and who was always there and even when you were stealing from her mm -hmm. continued to be there and provided a place for you to live and you see the sovereignty of God in the money that your great grandmother left for you to be able to go to school and so it's cool to know that as a teenager you had no plans to go to college but God did have plans for you to go to college and how God knew in a very early place in life, and in fact, the Bible would say God knew before you were born, where things were going to end up and how here we are sitting talking about the faithfulness of God and your plans to go to seminary. Yeah. And so, you know, you, all of that there in your story, the, the, the brokenness that the Scripture talks about, the grace of God and the sovereignty of God who truly never leaves us alone and, and is always there for us and always in some ways behind the scenes working out His purposes in our lives. And so that's an incredible, incredible thing, you know. Absolutely. Um, got a couple questions for you. Yeah. So one question that I would have for you, and I think this is really important because as adults, sometimes we can see teenagers who are making some really bad choices. And we can have... I think in the church we can be really guilty of kind of having uh, judgmental thoughts. And of course sin is sin, and sin needs to be called sin. But, but we can have a tendency sometimes to give up on people. Your story is a story of, boy, wasn't it great your grandmother didn't give up on you, and more importantly that God didn't give up on you. What would be your advice to an adult who knows somebody who's going through what you're going through right now? That's a great question. Um, I look at, and you, you nailed it with, with my grandmother. Um, I look at her consistency. Um, I, I put her through the ringer. I yeah. mean, if she was here right now, she would say, oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I put her through the ringer. But to answer that question, I look at what she did. Yeah. Um, and not only, of course, she you know, she forgave me consistently, um, and she communicated to me always um, how difficult it was for her. And yeah. she was so brutally honest with me that I, I'm thankful for that to this day. I hated it at that time, but I look back, and those words of honesty, um, and sometimes it would be communicated differently. <laughs> sometimes yeah. it'd sure. be in anger, but sure. the honesty, the consistency, and one thing about my grandmother that has radically changed my life without a doubt is that she is a praying woman mm. and she always has been mm. and um, 
even in her struggles in her own life, uh, you know, struggles with sin and struggles with um, relationships and things like that, she has always been a praying woman, mm -hmm. and even more so these last few years. Um, yeah. And I have seen God reach out and touch her and, and other people because of that. Yeah. Um, and I guess that would be my advice is, especially if it's family yeah. and not, um, but period is be consistent. Mm -hmm. um, be consistent and be honest to communicate because um, that's really hard sometimes and I think <clears throat> I think from one spectrum you might yes see adults who are frustrated and judgmental but also who don't say anything and who are permissive um, and I would say like ask God to give you the words to say to communicate to prick the heart yeah. of, of whoever it is um, and then prayer I mean I mean, the Bible says it. It's all over the Bible. That the prayer of the righteous person, yeah. it's working and prayer it has works. power. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, you, you, you use the word consistency, and that, that makes so much sense because in your life growing up, there was a lot of inconsistency. And so what your grandmother provided was a consistent, sometimes tough love, yeah. but she provided consistency. And so probably for you, with all the things that were inconsistent around you, she was the one person you could count on. And so as a church, I think it's important for us to hear consistency is important because everybody's, everybody's lives from time to time, sometimes we, we deal with inconsistency and we want to know that somebody's there. And so that's a great word. Exactly. Second question that I have for you, and, and, and this will probably be the final one, but for the person who's watching this this evening, or, you know, we never know how God uses things. I mean, somebody may be watching this right now and say, you know, I know somebody who's going through a similar thing and they may, they may send this person to this site to watch this yeah. later on in the week. But for the person who is struggling like you were struggling, for the teenager who has the rebellious spirit, for the college student who just has had a tough lot in life and can't figure it out, even for the adult who finds himself or herself in a pattern of brokenness, what word of advice would you give to them? The first thing I would say is that God is not ashamed of you. Mm. That would be the very first mm. thing. Um, That's correct. God is not. God does not look and frown down upon you because of your sin with yeah. hatred and despise. Because I think often that's what kept me so far away from him is like I can't I can't approach him because look at how I live my life um, I don't deserve and I really didn't want it because of that out of spite um, that God would judge me and that's the thing is he he doesn't he's already placed his judgment on the cross um, and I think with that is the really hard part of okay God isn't ashamed of me but it's also you have to be honest with yourself before you can be honest with anybody else mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. where you truly are in the decisions that you make and the things that you are stuck with as far as sin, as far as poor thinking habits and poor decision making um, is, is look at your life. I mean, where are you really in relation to where God wants you to be, knowing that He's not ashamed of you. Mm -hmm. um, and other who in your life can you reach out to? Yeah. Because there's somebody. Yeah. There is. Um, my, for me, it was really just my grandmother, but then God started to provide more and more people and opportunities. Um, so, yeah, those are probably those three things. Mm. Oh, those are great things. Yeah. So don't know that God's not ashamed of you. Mm -hmm. Be honest with yourself. Yeah. And reach out to particularly the people of God yes. to help point you to God. Yes. Those are great words. Yeah. Listen, I appreciate you sharing your story tonight, and we appreciate uh, what you've done here at First Baptist, working with college students, and we're excited about God's plans for you uh, as you begin seminary. And so it's, it's our honor to be, a, to be your home church. It's our honor to, to kind of be a part of your life and be able to see what God does through you in the future. And for those of you who've joined us this evening, thank you so much for joining us for... Uh, this evening's edition of This Is My Story. What an incredible story of the faithfulness of God. And what a great word. God is never ashamed of you. Listen, I want to encourage you to do what Hayden has said. I want to encourage you to be honest with yourself about where you are in life 
and to reach out to Him, first of all, but also reach out to God's people. If there's any way we can ever help you at the church, we'd love for you to contact us and we'd be glad to help you in, in any way because we believe that God does hear prayers. We do believe that God is faithful and we do believe that God has a plan for your life and Hayden's story is just an incredible testimony of that truth. Thank you again so much for joining us this evening. Hope that you'll join us next week. Hope that you have a great week this week.